Yes. 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 So let's start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're very thrilled to have Gustavo Crespi joining us today. But before introducing Gustavo, I would like to very briefly outline our housekeeping rules. So please mute yourselves during other people's interventions. We will record this presentation, and we are also live streaming it now on YouTube. So if you have any concerns of que or questions regarding privacy and security, please let us know. This is the moment. Um, in case we face some problems with the call, uh, it has happened once before only that we, we got an ambush from outsiders. We had to finish the call and we we will send you the like a new link to like through email, but I don't think that will happen. So no worries. And finally, please, if you have some questions or if you have some reflections, please write them down on the chat uh, as we progress with the presentation. So after Gustavo finishes, he can address address them and just keep um, sparkling the conversation. Um, finally, I would like to say a couple of things about our, our group, like where you can find us for those who are new, but I reckon that most of us um, already know about this group, we belong to this network, but if you want to contact us, that's our email address, uh, we do have a group in Google's group, um, and we also have two platforms or two accounts or two profiles in LinkedIn, we have a closed group where um, we want to spark uh, like a more fluid dialogue among us and exchange ideas about perhaps policy interventions in our region. And then we have a, an open group for everyone who wants to know about what we're doing, uh, both on LinkedIn. And finally, we have a small space on the LALIX website where we put all the, the slides and also links to the, to the recordings of these presentations. I don't know, Carlotta, if you would like to say Anything else before I introduce Gustavo? Uh, to introduce Gustavo, or are you introducing Gustavo? I, I, I normally I just say what this group is about in case there is, but I don't think there is anybody new today. Is there anybody new that hasn't heard me? Well, basically, we want to connect the uh, the students, the experts, the PhDs, etc., in, in technology policy with the people who are doing technology policy in the ground. So this group is basically to connect those, those sorts of people and hopefully to get some of the PhDs and, and master's people in policy to work not necessarily in academia, but to work either with government or with uh, international organizations, which is the case of, of Gustavo Crespi, whom we have today, who is working for quite a few years now in the Inter-American Development Bank, the BID. And he also worked for the Canadian IDRC, which is another fantastic funding organization for, for research and innovation and so on. But anyway, uh, I don't consider this the introduction unless, you know, if um, Melina, has something to say. No, I think that's, that's, a, that's a perfect summary of, of the aim of this group. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Gustavo. Uh, Gustavo is a lead specialist in the competitiveness and innovation division in the Inter-American Development Bank. He also served as a senior program officer in the International Development Research Center, IDRC of Canada. He holds a PhD in science and technology policy studies from Sussex University, from SPRU, uh, a master's in economic uh, development and international trade from the School of Economics and Business Administration of the University of Chile, and a BA in economics from the National University of Córdoba, Argentina. His interests <laughs> include industrial development, technological change, industrial structure and development of the firm and management and technology policy evaluation, especially in developing countries. 
He has written and published numerous articles on the topics in journals such as the World Development, World Development Research Policy, Industrial and Corporate Change, the Journal of Technology Transfer, the Oxford Review of Economic Policy, Technovation, Small Business Economics, among others. Finally, Gustavo is a member of the editorial board of journals such as Policy Research and the International Journal of Learning Technology, Innova Innovation and Development. So welcome, Gustavo. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, most of us had already familiarized with your work, so we're looking forward to hearing about your reflections and insights from working in an international organization. So the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Carlota. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Melina, for, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to share uh, the presentation right now. Let me see if working well. Uh, check this. Uh, following uh, a previous conversation that I had with uh, Carlota, I have uh, divided my presentation in two parts. The first part is about my personal trajectory, trying to explain you how it was that a uh, SPRU graduate ended up working in Washington, D.C. for a multilateral organization uh, like the IDB, uh, and all the different uh, paths that I followed to, to reach to that point. Uh, and the second is uh, more about the, the type of work that we're doing at the bank in the area of science and technology and, and policy. And, in, and in, with a particular focus on what I think is the most important uh, thing that we need to cover with our project, which is uh, the development of institutional capacity uh, for policy design and policy implementation. So uh, the presentation is quite long. So if it's too long, just uh, let me just tell me to stop and I will stop there. Uh, well, who I am? Uh, this is the entrance of my city in Cordoba, which is a city in the middle of Argentina, about 700 kilometers from Buenos Aires and about 1,200 kilometers from Santiago, which is, means that it's in the middle, the middle of, uh, of the southern corn. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, I was born in Cordoba. Uh, then I attended to the School of Economics of... Uh, of School of Economic and Business of the National University of Cordoba, which is a public university, where I got my BA degree in economics in 1990. Uh, and why I decided to study economics? Uh, it is a combination of a family tradition with a particular concern of public policy. And in a country where economic crisis is the rule, no, it's, it's a permanent economic crisis. So being an economist in Argentina is, uh, uh, you normally have a work, have some job to do. <laughs> uh, the Cordoba School of Economics at that time was mostly focused on studying short-term macroeconomic issues. Uh, the Cavallos team, the, 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 the team that established the convertibility law, the currency board in Argentina during the 90s, was a team that emerged from the University of Cordoba from my school. So the focus was very much on the macro issues. Uh, however, there was a very small group in the Department of Economics, a very small group uh, of researchers, basically two researchers, working on industrial organizations. And these two researchers were graduates from Sao Paulo and Campinas. Uh, so that was, I joined the group and, and that was my first uh, interaction with innovation as a study field within economics. Uh, but then came Santiago, Chile. Uh, in 1993, 1995, about three years after my graduation, I did a master's of science degree in economic growth and international trade at the University of Chile. At that time, it was better known as the name of Eco Latina. Uh, and this was part of an IDB funded program. At that time, uh, the IDB had a scholarship programs where students from countries in Latin America that were starting structural reforms programs, such as was the case of Argentina under the convertibility law, uh, could also go to study public policy 
in other countries of Latin America where the structural reforms uh, programs were most advanced, which was the case of Chile. So a lot of people from Cordoba at that time with funding from the IDB moved to Chile to study different issues regarding to uh, economics. In my case, I decided to study economic growth and international trade. And, and I think this had two very important effects in my career. First, I came across to the new growth theories, Lucas, Romer, Aguillon, were all very much on the top of the agenda of the master program in, in Chile. And we know that these theories put innovation at the core of economic growth. And the second important effect was that I met Jorge Katz, who, who has just moved to Chile from Buenos Aires to take a new job at ECLAC. So Jorge Katz in, in Santiago became my supervisor, my thesis supervisor of the master's degree program. So I started to also work with him. Uh, after finishing my studies in Santiago, the University of Chile, I joined Jorge uh, at the ECLAC, and together we did the first Oslo manual uh, innovation survey, Oslo manual version, Oslo version of the innovation survey of, of, of Chile in 1995. Uh, and it was one of the first ones using the Oslo methodology in Latin America. And also we did several studies regarding the Chilean national innovation systems, including several firm level case studies. That was the first time that I managed to go to an actual company and to study how a company, in, how several companies, in fact, in Latin America, in particular Santiago, were actually learning about how to innovate. In 1995, I became an uh, instructor professor at the School of Economics in the University of Chile, the same school where I did my master's degree, working under Manuel Agosina and Jorge Katz's uh, leadership. And there we developed a whole new area of impact evaluation studies of productive development policies. At that time, one of the leaders of uh, impact evaluation studies in economics, which is James Heckman, he was a uh, doing some teaching at the School of Economics in Chile. So I did manage to get involved with uh, this uh, empirical approach of doing quasi-experimental studies of policy implementation. Uh, between 1995 and 1999, uh, we carried out several impact evaluation studies of STI policies uh, that were just being rolled out by CORFO, which is the National Development Bank of Chile. Uh, we also set the project selection and evaluation system of the first core force business innovation funds, 1995, 1998. Um, and that was when I was my second interaction with the IDB. My first interaction with IDB was when they were the funding agency of my scholarship program in Chile. My second interaction was with the IDB because the bank was the main founder of Corfos Innovation Program. So we are doing the impact evaluation of how these programs were being implemented in Chile. And then, well, this is not India, this is the, the pavilion in Brighton. Uh, I, 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 I moved to Spru in 2000, in 2000. I started my PhD program at Spru. Uh, my supervisors were Nick von Tunzelman and Pari Patel. Uh, and the focus of my research as Pro was about understanding industrial dynamics in developing countries with particular focus on Chilean manufacturing before and after the trade openings. Uh, in 2004, when I finished my PhD, I joined Spru as a research fellow, uh, where I work in different projects funded by the Commission, in particular the PATVAL program about the evaluation of patents, and the systematic EU project. Uh, I also uh, work for the Queen Mary's University in London uh, in a microdata project at the Office of Natural Statistics. My focus was on doing all the uh, first work with the innovation, the CIS Innovation Survey of, uh, of the UK in 2005-2006. And there I work under the supervision of Jonathan Haskell. Uh, by that time, 2006, my wife says, enough is enough of bad weather. <laughs> uh, I want to move to something with a little bit more of sunshine. 
So uh, we decided that was, uh, even when I had the possibility to remain in England, uh, we decided that it was time to get back to, to Latin America. Uh, and in fact, there was something, uh, a missing point or missing link in my research because uh, I was doing a quite a very interesting research uh, working for the commission, as I mentioned, working for the Office of National Statistics of the UK, but this research was completely disconnected with Latin America. So I, I, it was became very clear for me that I was going, if I was going to remain as Peru or what uh, with Queen Mary, uh, I was going to, to move to a different path. Um, and my Latin American background was probably going to, to be left behind. Uh, so uh, we evaluated several options about to come back, to come back to the university or to return to uh, public government offices uh, or so on. And then there was the possibility of moving to Montevideo and Uruguay, working for the IDRC of Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, I learned about this position uh, because the position was being advertised in The Economist. So I, didn't, I just applied using The Economist application window. Uh, the IDRC, the International Development Research Center of Canada. At the moment that I applied to IDRC in 2006, uh, I didn't have any idea then I learned after that when they hired me that uh, the strong connection that IDRC has, still has with SPRU. In fact, IDRC was created by a, a, an act uh, in 1968 that was actually written by the group uh, led by Chris Freeman and other uh, SPRU researchers that moved to Canada uh, um, in order to, to, to create IDRC as a research funding unit to promote uh, in research and innovation in uh, developing countries. IDRC has different uh, offices uh, around the world uh, and the regional office for Latin America is based in Montevideo. So that's the reason was I was hired by IDRC and they immediately posted to the regional office in Montevideo. And why in Montevideo? Because at that time, the IDRC was deploying a new program called Innovation, Technology, and Society for Developing Countries. And that program had a strong focus on science and technology policy research. The leader of the program, uh, Paul uh, Richard Eisner, who hired me, was also a former school graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, during 2006, 2009, working for the IDRC, we financed several research grants in the areas of innovation surveys with ECLAC, for example, and several science and technology policy reviews, uh, studies, for example, with Martin Bell and Annabel Marin and his team on the multinational roles of in LAC uh, innovation systems. Uh, studies on social innovation with a group of uh, Campinas, uh, a, a comparative study of BRICS innovation systems uh, led by a group of uh, Eduardo Casiolato at the University, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and so on and so on. However, in 2009, something happened. The former ITS director of design Richard Eisner moved to become uh, the director of the, I, if I don't remember well, the EPSRC, which is the Physics and Engineering Research Council of Canada. So he left IDRC and a new director was appointed. And the priorities of the program move, uh, move from doing policy research to doing something that in Canada call it action research, whatever that means. But for me, it was very uncomfortable. Uh, so I decided to start looking for uh, different uh, alternatives uh, for my careers. Uh, and then I ended up in Washington DC. Why? Uh, in 2009, they opened a position at the IDB. The IDB had just established a new division called Science and Technology Division that was at that time led by Gonzalo Rivas. 
uh, Chilean from Corfo. I had worked with Gonzalo as a counterpart when we did the impact evaluation studies of Corfo's programs during the 90s, for example. And, and then uh, the opening position, I also uh, applied for the position I was, and I was hired to, to join the division. The focus initially of the division was only on science and technology, and it was a division under the social department. It was not a division under the competitiveness on, on productivity department, something that was uh, quite uh, weird, basically. Uh, during 2009, 2013, I focused on leading the social, the, the science and technology division research agenda. Uh, we did uh, quite a lot of studies on innovation and employment uh, with Jacques Marais and Pierre Monet of UNUMERIT, uh, innovation in services. We did a uh, quite uh, couple of years studies on innovation obstacles with Maria Sabona and Tommaso Charlie. Uh, and we did, we did a lot of impact evaluations and uh, we continue the collection of innovation surveys in many different countries in the region. Uh, but I also support, uh, supported project teams in the field, in particular doing, for example, monitoring and evaluation plans and in particular policy dialogue. Uh, I was also instrumental on augmenting the scope of the division by including the areas of innovation and competitiveness, which is, I think was very important for the survival of the division. Uh, the bank is a bank, uh, and in order to, to have a business area that, that progress over time, you need to have a minimum amount of projects approved every year. Being a science and technology focused division only, we only had two, maximum three projects per year, and that was a, a small number for the bank. So the only possibility was to increase the scope of the division uh, in order to uh, include other areas of programming and uh, increasing by that the portfolio of our intervention. Nowadays, we have between eight and nine programs per year. Uh, but that was in, in order to reach that increase in the number of projects, was very important to increase the scope of the division, as I mentioned, to the area of innovation and competitiveness, and later on moving the division from the social department to the institutions department. And this is where CTI, which is the, the, the current name of the division, was born, Competitiveness, Technology, and Innovation Division. Uh, in 2013, after almost five years after I joined the IDB, I moved to the field. Until that time, I was in Washington. Uh, and why I decided to move to the field? Uh, it's not a require for you to move to the field. You have to apply to move to the field. Uh, and and I, I realized that multilaterals are very complex organizations. Uh, you cannot learn the routines of a multilateral development bank, for example, the World Bank, for example, the IDB, uh, in the university. And the learning is very, very slow. Uh, and much of the learning is learning by doing. So I felt that in order to fully understand the operation of the bank, I had to move, I had to be much more involved in project design and implementation, not only in research, or not only doing research to support the project, but also leading, leading the design and implementation of the project. And the IDB, this is something a little bit more easier to do than the World Bank, for example, because the IDB has a country office in each borrowing member. We have seven, 27 countries that are borrowing members of the bank. Each staff in each country office spends up to five years in the office before rotating again. And the projects in the field are led by the field staff uh, with the support from headquarters. So I first moved to Montevideo in between, again, between 2013, 2018. And then since 2019, I am based in Lima, in Peru. Uh, in order to tell you a little bit about how the, the, the bank actually work, uh, the bank is organized as a matrix. And each row of the matrix is a borrowing country. And each column of the matrix is a sector division. Sector divisions are organized in department, which is institutions, 
Economic Integration Social Department or Social Protection Department to uh, speak properly, and the Infrastructure Division uh, Department under the call the, the what they call the Vice President of Vice Presidency of Sectors, and then country offices are also organized in departments. Uh, there are four departments, which is the Southern Cone, uh, Andean Region. Uh, Central America and the Caribbean. And these departments are under vice, the vice presidency of countries. Each country office leads the policy dialogue with the country where the office is located. And this country, dia this policy dialogue is then consolidated in a country strategy, which is a multi year program of about between four to five years, where establish the basic rules of the programming. Of, of the bank in that particular country. But then you have country programming document, which is a, a, yearly, a yearly document where the actual projects that are going to be implemented uh, within this more broad uh, strategy, country strategy, are going to be agreed. So country office do the, the programming with the country, and then they demands on the base of the country demands and the actual composition of the strategy and the country programming document, the country office demands knowledge services from, this, from the vice presidents of sectors. And the knowledge service and the vice president of sectors, that is where the departments and the divisions are located, provide the country offices with expertise, in particular the staff people uh, that's going to be supporting the technical dialogue, the project preparation, the monitoring of the projects, and the, the, the final PCRs, which is project completion reports of each other projects that are being funded by the bank. So in terms of the, the way how we work, basically, we normally start doing the work in a particular country by uh, implementing a knowledge product. A knowledge product can be, for example, a science and technology policy review of the country, or for example, an impact evaluation, or for example, an innovation survey. So we do the knowledge product, we then have the policy dialogue with the country. If the country agrees that we need, we have a problem and we have a, some gaps in, this, in, the, in the innovation area that need to be solved with the public policy, we then we do a technical cooperation. The technical cooperation is, is in order to design a particular intervention to solve a problem that was uh, identified in the knowledge probe and then was agreed in the policy dialogue. We did the technical cooperation, the technical cooperation, we designed the project, and then we uh, provide the funding for the project. Then we implement the project, we understand what are the problems of the implementation, we discover new problems during the implementation. And between the discovery of that new problems, we do a new knowledge product, and then we feed back the policy dialogue process. So this is the way how it's a very simplified, it's much more complex than this, uh, but it's the way how uh, we normally uh, work with the countries. So uh, let's move back to the second part of the presentation, which is more about uh, what we have under, we have learned about the the important topic of institutional capacities. Uh, LAC has been, the LAC region, Latin American region and the Caribbean has been in, experimenting with science and technology innovation policies since at least 1950s. It's before 1950 because the first uh, schools or the first experimental stations in the case of agricultural research in Latin America started by the end of the 19th century. Example. I remember the, the um, Sao Paulo Agricultural Experimental Institute, which was by the end of uh, 1800s uh, or something like that. Yes, 1880 or something like that. Uh, and without much success. Uh, and since that time, uh, I think that there are three different policy paradigms that can be identified. We had first the, what we call it at the bank, the supply side approach that covers the period between 1950s and 1980s. Uh, it was very, very based 
and inspired by the linear model approach, uh, the, direct, the direct production of knowledge by public institutions, universities, and research centers. I have, here I have to mention that the first, first lending program, the bank was established in 1958. And in 1959, the bank funded the first pro ever project in a Latin American country. And that was a project in the area of science and technology. It was a project to fund the implementation of the research lab of four national universities in Argentina in 1959. Um, governance, governance of the, of the policy, STI policy was based on the model of the National Research Councils uh, with a strong participation of government and academia in a very top-down approach. Then you have government research institutes and labs of public-owned enterprises in strategic sectors, like for example, oil, uh, and sectors that were chosen for the in import substitution policy. Uh, but there was a complete missing link with the private sector overall. Uh, and for example, at that time in innovation policy, there were completely lack of connection with SMEs policies, for example. Uh, that paradigm was replaced what, for what we call the demand side approach that was from between 1980s and early 2000, that was inspired for the Washington Consensus structural reforms programs, liberalization, privatization, budget cuts. It was a model based on imported technology and this combined with the shutdown of many government research institutes and also a state on enterprises. Towards the end of the 90s, uh, however, new market intervention policies were established, uh, mostly horizontal matching grants schemes. Uh, new actors such as innovation agencies were created to manage these schemes. And it was a complete bottom-up approach uh, without government, with a very, with, in a context, I would say, of very weak governance. And then we have what we call it a systemic approach that started in 2000s until now, uh, and it's a reflection of the late diffusion of the natural innovation system model and uh, that recognized uh, the importance of the interaction between supply and demand policies. Uh, horizontal policies became more complex using a consortium approach, university industry alliances, for example, there is an increasing deployment of vertical policies with mission-oriented funds and general purpose technology support programs in several countries. Uh, the policy mix become uh, more, uh, become more complex uh, because that increases the, the needs of public, public and public-public coordination. New, new actors uh, such as myth of science and technology are being created or innovation cabinets have emerged. And it's a combination of top-down, bottom-up governance up model. So if you look at the, 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 the evolution of the R&D expenditure as a percentage of the GDP across these, these different models, I would say, you see something like that. I mean, there was quite a lot of investment in R&D as a percentage of GDP during the import substitution period. Then that went down during the uh, Washington consensus model and demand side approach, but it started to recover uh, during the final phase of the demand side approach, and it started to recover more strongly during the systemic approach. However, if you look at the long-term uh, evolution of this indicator, uh, the growth rate is, is almost zero, basically. The, the trend is completely flat. And you see that in, in, in this also different uh, pattern. Uh, you have the evolution of the R&D as a percent of GDP in Latin America, which is basically moving very, very slightly upwards. And that compares very dramatically with South Korea, where we started having the same amount of R&D investment as a percent of GDP during the 70s and the 60s. And then since the 80s onwards, uh, Korea basically took off and we are completely stagnant at the same levels, basically. 
And this poor performance in inputs translate in disappointing performance, also in productive diversification and productivity. This is, is a, uh, you know, this famous book, the 50 Shades of Grey. Well, this is the 50 Shades of Grey for the IDB. Uh, this is the composition of the exports of each country in Latin America, uh, uh, where the, the cell, each cell of the graph, the color of the cell captures the degree of complexity of the products that are being exported. Darker the color, higher the complexity. So if you see Latin America on the right, uh, complexity is about 10%. And nothing has changed a lot. It has, re it has remained a very low complexity export basket. But if you see Korea on the other side, complexity was higher than Latin America at the beginning of the period, which is 1984, when the data started. But then from then onwards, complexity has increased permanently. And low complex products are more, as in the case of Korea, have almost disappeared from the export market. And you see also that in the productivity, in this case of the relative productivity of total factor productivity of Latin America against the US. And, and, and Korea against the US. The red one is, the, sorry, the blue one is Latin America, which is going down. Today we have a relative total factor productivity, which is lower than we had in 1960s in comparison with the US. And this is completely the opposite in the case of Korea and other uh, tiger countries of the Southeast Asia, where they managed to catch up with the total factor productivity of the US. So that led us to the bank to, to prepare this book, which is sorry because the, this, this, uh, this uh, capture is in, is in Spanish, not in English, but it's how to, to rethink uh, productive development. It's a book that we wrote in 19, uh, in, sorry, in 2014, 2015, uh, together with a lot of uh, researchers uh, from different universities from the region and also from the US. And with the idea to rethink about uh, this issue of productive development policies and within them, we include a couple of chapters on science and technology and innovation policies. Uh, so most, most of the current IDB thinking on science and technology policies is in our book that I just mentioned. Uh, in the book, we identify three tests in order to justify a policy intervention. The first test is, the, is what we call it the market failure test. So we need to, clarify, to clearly identify the market of all coordination failure that intervention is to solve. But then we need the policy design test, which is answer the question, is the policy design that, or the policy instrument that we want to do or we want to use to solve the market failure, the correct one to solve the market failure. In many cases, we arrive when we do a diagnosis, we arrive that the problem is lack of financing for innovation. And then the, we recommend a policy design, which is a subset. Well, actually, no, that is not correct. I mean, if the problem is you have a problem financing, the policy design is a financial instrument, either credit to innovation, either a guarantee program to innovation, either equity for innovation. If the problem, the market failure are spillovers or lack of appropriability, then the policy design is a subsidy or a tax credit. So there, is a, there, there should be a connection between the market failure test, the problem that you want to solve, and the instrument that you need to use or do you like to use to solve the problem. But then there is a third test, which is institutional test. If the country of the agency of the region has the right institutional capacities to implement the policy, because not all the policies require the same institutional capacities. In fact, there, is, there are different institutional capacities for different policies. And this is the third match that need to be considered. So there is a constellation of science and technology policy instruments. So we need a typology for the analysis. 
And in the main report, we classify innovation policies along two dimensions. The scope of the policy, which is you have horizontal, transversal policies, uh, or vertical, sectorial policies. But then you have that the policy can be classified according to the type of the policy. The type of the policy could be to provide the public good, for example, knowledge, human capital, or the type of the policy could be to do a market intervention in order to someone else to provide the public good. For them, you use the subsidies or the tax credits, for example. But, but within the, these two dimensions, scope and type of the policy are very important because the failures, the design, and in particular, institutional capacities are very different in each one of these dimensions. For example, good example of a, a good a public good, a policy that provides public goods and is horizontal is to have a good competition policy. An example of a public good policy, vertical could be to establish a technological center for one particular sector, for example, for let's say agriculture or let's say forestry. Uh, an example of a market intervention, horizontal policy is a subsidy, a tax credit. Every, everyone that do a research project receive a tax credit independently from the sector where the project is being implemented or being developed. And the same with the subsidy. And then an example of a market intervention vertical policy is when you have a tax break for a particular strategic sector of technology, for example, software biotechnology, or in particular, for example, in providing tax credit or subsidies for, let's say, um, the solar uh, renewable energy industry and so on. However, I'm, I mean, I'm going to stop here with the policy, uh, mentioning of the typology, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, first, the third test, institutional capacity test. Uh, within that, a good institutional design uh, for policy implementation, the how, what we're going to do is as important as the substance of the policy, the what to do. Uh, a good institutional design is important not only for the how, but also for the what. Because market and coordination failures are not always known beforehand. This is something that we learn of working in many projects. Market and coordination failures need to be discovered through process of learning during the implementation. And this process of learning are framed by institutions. So the feasibility of technically solid science and technology policy is limited by the risk of government failures that make the remedy worse than the problem. So institutional design must consider then the main characteristic of science and technology policies in order to control for this region, for these government failures and to deploy uh, solid, technically solid interventions. So which are the main characteristics of science and technology policies that need to be considered during the institutional design? The first characteristic is the need to discover the right policies. The second is, the is that these are policies that require some degree of technological, technical skills, sophisticated technical skills in some cases. Uh, the difficulty to install, and these are policies that are difficult to install in the policy agenda. Uh, they require uh, sustained efforts over time. They demand intensive interaction with the private sector. They are subject to capture and rent seeking because of that. And they demand the collaboration among different public agencies. The institutional design needs to internalize all of these characteristics. Otherwise, the solutions are not going to work. The first problem, the need to discover the right policies. Uh, in many other policies areas, uh, the beneficiaries and the solutions for a problem are known in advance. For example, you have an hepatitis A outbreak and say, you know, which is your problem, 
And then you know which is the solution. The solution is a vaccination campaign. And, the, and, the, and there is a protocol for the vaccination campaign. The protocol says first doses at 12, second doses 12 months after. So doses and delivery, and delivery mechanism are known and based on protocols. Science and technology and innovation policies within are different because the real problems are discovered during the implementation. And even when the problems are known in advance, the policies depend on the context. Target population is not always well-defined and success depends on private sector reaction. So this requires a lot of tacit knowledge and flexibility. So science and technology policies need to be configured as a searching machines, exploring the productive space to identify the most important problems, the right solution, and the best ways to deliver. This implies flexible processes, policy implementation that make room for learning, and a culture that accepts control risk and is willing to accept some failures. This is a challenge for a typical public sector organization based on rigid rules, previous authorizations, and risk aversion. And also, I have to tell you, it was also a challenge for the bank because the bank had to learn how to implement science and technology policies. Because the bank, the traditional approach of the bank for science and technology policy projects was a railroad, a highway. Huh? It was to design a project like that was an infrastructure project. And this is not an infrastructure project. In this science and technology project, this for me is very important, uh, is uh, our projects where ex post control is far more important than, than ex ante control. Uh, but in Latin America, we tend to do the other way around. I mean, we are very, very, we are the genius of the ex ante control, and we never do anything about ex post control. So we need to change the chip and do the things all the other way around. The second characteristic of science and technology policies is that they require some sort of sophisticated technical skills. And this is the thing that justifies institution has proof, for example. Science and technology, spill, science and technology innovation policies demand advanced technical skills for to identify market and coordination failures and design aligned policies to this market and coordination failures. They require technical skills to evaluate R&D projects and determine its merits. They require technical skills to select firms with high growth potential and to carry out impact evaluation. And in Latin America, unfortunately, the best institutional capacities in LAC are in central banks and the Ministry of Finance on the tax agencies or regulatory agencies but science and technology agencies are not characterized for having the right human resources that are needed to do this type of policies. Many science and technology policies in the region that work well, there are some cases that we have very good results, are managed by agencies outside of traditional bureaucracies. Some policies are delegated to development banks, like the case of the BNDES in Brazil, involving the design and implementation of science technology policies. Other under mixed agencies, like for example, the ANI of Uruguay, the National Agency of Research and Innovation of Uruguay, which is an agency created by the government under private sector law, or a private agency, like the case of Fundacion Chile. Uh, these agencies have more flexibility to hire personnel with the right technical skill, uh, uh, grant, uh, right technical skills of capabilities with larger room for experimentation and policy discovery. They also have this dedicated specialized agency, longer time frames for the accumulation of technical capital, of technical capacities. Uh, Fundacion Chile, ANI, uh, Bendes, they remain. The ministry changed with the government. And this is a very important thing that uh, to accumulate uh, institutional capacities. 
Third problem with science and knowledge innovation policies is that the, the difficulties to install the policies in the agenda. Uh, they are less fancy than social programs that transfer cash to the poor or infrastructure. There is no picture here. These are intangibles, so there's no picture uh, that the government can take uh, after project implementation. Normally, uh, are policies that are allocated under weak ministries without resources and political support, and sometimes within ministry done where not even the responsible ministry know that they, he has the priority of science and technology policy. This happens a lot when the science and technology policy are under the Ministry of Education. And then we want to talk about with the Ministry of Education in several countries. And the answer that we receive, which is very surprising, is that why you are coming to talk to me? Well, and they had to explain the ministry that because innovation is under your area, ministry. Well, this is something that happened a lot in, in, in Latin American countries. So the inclusion of science and technology innovation policy in the agenda is not automatic. And the rank and the importance of the responsible ministry mean is an important element. Uh, the degree of presidential or prime minister level support becomes critical. Uh, it's not, and I'm not sure if everyone knows, but for example, the Minister of Science and Technology of Korea is also the deputy prime minister of the government of Korea. So that is a signal that. Uh, the priority that the sector has in the um, overall government organization. The fourth problem of science and technology policies and is the need for time consistency. Uh, science and technology innovation require time to deliver the results. And policies that seek changing the behavior of firms and research, I mean, these are policies that, re, that, that seek changing the behavior of firms and researchers. This is something that cannot be achieved in the short term, something that is necessary to build these changes over time. It requires time to build institutional capacity and lack of time consistency has, has been also a problem in the region. Uh, many programs uh, are interrupted when government changes. Even in Chile, a country with strong institutional capacities, science and technology have suffered important swings. For example, the cluster program under Bachelet, first government of Bachelet was dismantled when Piñera came to power. In catching up economies, this problem of time consistency uh, was many times solved by a dictator, like the case of Korea and Taiwan, or by a dominant party, like the case of, Ch of Singapore. Uh, fortunately, these options are not in the current uh, policy option frame of Latin America. So we need to seek for other mechanisms to solve this problem. For example, we need to look for the generation of broad policy consensus to make them state policies. National Council of Innovations, for example, at the presidential level are very important uh, for this. Uh, or the introduction of policies by law or special laws uh, to involve uh, stakeholders interested in policy continuity like the private sector or the IDB. Perhaps the most important asset that we have as a multilateral development bank when we work with the countries is not the money and it's not the technical support. It's the commitment that we require from the country to carry out the project for the long term because the project is going to be funded by the bank and this funding uh, will be placed to a contract between the state and the bank. And this contract operates like a safety box for the sector because government can change, but the contract will be in, uh, in place. Uh, we need to do credible, uh, credible and well done impact evaluations uh, and also, and also uh, delegate responsibility in agencies where the responsibility of the agency lasts more than a government period. For example, the chief, the chief scientist of Israel, of now the Israel Innovation Authority, lasts six years in position, which is two years more than the current period of government. The fifth problem of, uh, of science and technology innovation uh, policy is the risk of capture and rent seeking. Uh, policies, science and technology innovation policies normally generate winners and losers. 
uh, and then they generate incentives for grant seeking. Uh, however, not all innovation policy have the, this problem. And this is why our matrix where we divided the policies according to scope and type is very important. Policies with high stakes that concentrate a lot of subsidies in a small number of beneficiaries or sectors, for example, policies in the quadrant, uh, market intervention and vertical are more subject to capture than policies in the other quadrant. Uh, and also we need to consider that capturing might not only uh, be by the private sector, uh, the scientific community can also capture the science policy. So some ideas to mitigate the capture is required, for example, for private co-financing to validate demands. So if the private sector wants something from government, okay, show me that you're willing to co-finance what you want from the government. Uh, Consultation with independent experts or with opposite interests. Uh, sunset clause with impact evaluation for renewal. I mean, we set the policy every five years and then at the end of the five year, we carry out an impact evaluation. The policy stopped by law. We carry out an impact evaluation and then we decided if the policy should continue, continue or not. Uh, the corporate governance of implemented agency are also mechanisms to reduce the importance of capture and rent seeking. At the beginning, we thought that this was a very important problem in Latin America. However, after many years of doing research and actual implementation in the field, we realized that this problem is a problem, but it's not the most important problem. Uh, this, many of the things under this area are quite well controlled. For me, this is the most, this, the following two are, are the most important ones. The first one is the public, uh, that the need for public-private collaboration. Because the public sector does not know what and the how. So built on the knowledge and the experience of the private sector for a good design and implementation is critical. Plus, private collaboration could help having the private sector involved in the policy process could also help to have longer time horizons for the policy in order to accumulate implementation capabilities. But quality of private collaboration depends on the quality of public confidence. Uh, if we put a, a ministry that doesn't have, doesn't have resources, doesn't have power, and is very weak, the private sector are not going to come to the table. Or the person that are from the private sector are going to come to the table are not the ones that are needed to be in the table. On the other hand, private sector interaction has some risk uh, because private firms can distort information to extract maximum subsidies, which is the problem of rent seeking that I mentioned before. So we need to think about how to frame uh, the interaction with the private sector in order to extract from the private sector the most amount of information as possible, but avoiding capture and rent seeking. And the other problem, which in Latin America is very critical for science and technology policy, and I'm finishing with this, is the public-public coordination. The problems to be solved reflect the complexity reality of the private sector, not how the public sector is organized. Many times, solutions require collaboration among agencies. For example, the Ministry of Industry would identify the need to do some research and train workers for the software industry. But neither the research or the training of workers is under the responsibility of the Ministry of Industry, nor she has the power to align the responsibilities of the other ministries. So the question here is how to guarantee the alignment of the other public sector organizations in order to solve problems that reflect the reality of the private sector, not the problems of how the government is organized. One possibility to solve these problems is give, is give responsibility to someone of higher rank. In Malaysia, for example, the responsibility to solve problems of public-public coordination is the prime minister. Normally, ministries are better than secretaries to solve these public-public coordination problems. Another possibility is to have dedicated cabinets 
some countries in Latin America have established uh, innovation cabinets. But these innovation cabinets only work if they meet frequently, if they are backed by high level political support. For example, if the president participate or the ministry show advances. Uh, the other, otherwise, they don't work. Or having budgetary mechanisms. For example, the Ministry of Finance allocate resources based on goals. And then you can have a matrix organization with vertical ministries with resources to buy uh, solutions from transversal ministries of agencies. For example, the Ministry of Industry could have resources to buy training from the Ministry of Education for the software industry. Uh, the corporate governance having cross boards of innovation agencies and science and technology agencies in the region is also a very important way of public coordination. Having rotation of the personnel among the agencies is also a good way to improve collaboration. Uh, to assign, this is the current situation of many Latin American countries, which is the assignment of science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurial programs to different ministries. Uh, this is something that is normally done, but we need to be clear that doing this requires strong coordination capacities. Because otherwise, you have fragmentation. And if you have fragmentation within the government, you will have overlapping of responsibilities, competition among programs, loss of synergies, and poor accountability. And also, you will favor the capturing of the pri by the private and scientific sectors. So to have some dominant minister uh, might be a good idea. And that perhaps is the reason why several, there is a recent wave in Latin America of countries creating science and technology ministries. The two uh, most recent ones are the one, in, the one in Chile and the one in Colombia. Uh, because it's, uh, if these ministries are well established and, and they are backed by the president and they have the resources, they could solve somehow this public public uh, coordination problem. One uh, innovation that we did in, the, in, in Peru to solve uh, these two things public and private collaboration and public public coordination was to establish. Uh, we started in Peru uh, in 2016. And then this model was uh, transferred to other countries in the region, Argentina, Costa Rica, Panama, which was the establishing of the, what we call it sector exec executive boards. Uh, the ex sector executive boards, we can have a full presentation on this. We can have another meeting, another time to discuss how this works. But uh, here in order to, to finish it, uh, uh, Normally, the, the, the sector executive boards are organized in each one of the critical sectors of the country, and they have an operative level body where the private sector stakeholders participate, public sector stakeholders that have responsibility to solve the problems of that particular sector also participate. And then you have a dedicated team, honest brokers, neutral, that try to make agreements between the private and public sector stakeholders. And then you have a high level board, which is the ministries of the sectors involved, uh, or the minister of the different areas of the government involves with the sector and also the minister of finance, which in all the countries in Latin America is the most powerful minister. Uh, and this high level body has high capacities for coordination and resource allocation. So these two levels complement each other. So, the board start working with some initial list of problems. We don't spend too much in doing diagnostics here. This is not a cluster program. In the typical cluster program, you have about one year or two years sometimes doing research about which is the problem of the sector and reaching consensus and so on. This for us is a waste of time. We start with a two weeks diagnosis and we identify one particular, one, two or three particular problems that need to be solved. We know that they are, these are not the most important problems, but we know that there is no diagnosis beforehand 
that could allow you to identify the most important problems. That the only way to identify your most important problems are by implementation. So start solving whatever problem that you have in face. And by the solving of that problem, you will start learning about the sector. And with the learning of the sector, you will start discovering which are the real problems of the sector. So we start with the initial list of problems. We choose three or four problems and we start solving them. And then based on the results, we adapt at update the initial list, solve new problems, and we include new ones in the list, and then we reconfigure the objectives of the board. And we work in that way. If, the, if this wheel gets locked, something that happens very uh, frequently sometimes because the solution of the problem many times require some input from other areas of government, if that is locked, we elevate the problem to a higher level body. If this higher level body can provide either the resources or the conflict solution, the replacements of the ministry, for example, that want to solve the problem, there a new regulation or a new legislation to solve the particular problem. So this is an example of technical, I would say, solution to a two important problems that science and policy have, which is public-public coordination and public-public uh, uh, coordination, collaboration and coordination. So to finish, science and technology policies demand top capabilities, technical capabilities to design, evaluate, and to monitor policies, organizational capabilities, managerial capabilities, private sector interaction capabilities, public-public collaboration capabilities, and political capabilities to obtain the resources and the political support and to protect the programs for undue influence. These top capabilities have strong synergies among each other. And different policies demand different capa capacities. Wide science and technology programs, such as mission programs, require strong public-public coordination capabilities in comparison with narrow science and technology and innovation policies. Horizontal science and technology innovation policies require to identify the failures and to set the parameters of the design. Vertical science and technology innovation policies are very intensive in public-private public collaboration to identify the missing inputs and public-public cooperation to arrange the delivery. But they require strong protection against capital and rent seeking because concentrated resources in few beneficiaries. Capabilities that require also capability to choose sectors. If you're going to do vertical policies, you need to have capability to choose. You cannot do vertical policy for everyone. So without mini, minimum capacities, it's best to discard the complex and risky policy, start by simple ones, accumulate capacities, and then start doing something more complex. Uh, how to create capabilities, how to accumulate capabilities. Uh, we think that this is an emerging area and we don't have direct measure of capabilities, but we have different approaches. Peer review by other agencies, experts, and international organizations are very useful for capabilities accumulation. The institutional evaluation program by the Argentinian Ministry of Science and Technology uses, uses uh, international peer reviewers to assess public research institutions, for example. Uh, we can use also sometimes indirect measures of capabilities, the World Economic Forum of the World Bank databases, but we don't like them. They are for them, for us, it's too broad. And the IDB, we are encouraging countries uh, to use uh, what we call it result-based loans for science and technology innovation programs. These are programs normally that include an institutional capacity strengthening component, which builds on the bank's assessment of institutional capacities which assess institution along six dimensions. So we assess institution on governance, higher uh, human resources, project management capacities, procurement capacities, financial capacities, and evaluation capacities. We identify the gaps and we create a particular component of the project to fill the gaps in institutional capacities. And then the work. And it's a warning in particular for people like me that went to SPRU and other uh, well-known centers of uh, science and technology policies to study how uh, 
science and technology policies are designed and implemented in other countries. Uh, we need to prevent uh, the, the prevalent practice for many people that have done a trajectory similar to the one that I follow for science and technology is to identify the best practice and implement it. Problem one, different science and technology innovation policies require different capabilities. So if you have a best practice in Korea, this does not re that require Korean capabilities that maybe you don't have in your own countries. Uh, second problem, policies are not implemented in the vacuum, but within contexts that are very rich in tacit behavioral norms and that are known ex ante, are discovered during the implementation. And problem three, countries have differ accord, differ according to the existing capabilities. So what it works in one context, it's very likely that it's not going to work in another context. So instead of talking about best practices, at the bank, we think that the, both, the best approach, the safety approach, is focused on best matches between policies and capabilities. Policies that overcome current institutional capability is better to leave them apart for the next phases of the, of the policy. Uh, classroom training is clearly important, but not enough, because science and innovation policy capabilities accumulate through learning by doing. So what conditions are necessary for learning by doing? First, a favorable framework, stability, flexibility, and evaluation. A methodology for learning uh, we need, uh, based on testing, uh, with monitoring of information, but uh, Chuck Sable called experimentalist governance. Uh, the focus is not on the, the focus is on the problem, not on the best pra practice. So normally several approaches can be experimented, generate feedback and adapt the policy design. Uh, incentives to improve uh, recognition, awards, learning based promotion are very important. Uh, and this requires a move from a culture of control ex ante to one of ex post evaluation, something that we're still lacking in Latin America. So I'm going to stop here. Um, we have a, what, I can, I, I'm going to leave you the presentation so you can go to the website and download the book uh, and also other presentations that cover these topics more in advance. And okay, thank you very much. And I think it was not too long. <laughs> Amazing, Gustavo. Thank you so much. I think you gave us a lot to reflect on, and I'm sure we are going to be able to unpack a little bit some of the ideas that you left us with in this uh, next minute. Uh, Carlota had two questions, and then I will follow the order in the chat. So after Carlota asks her questions, we can move to Ben to Benjamin. Uh, and then we can uh, allow Joao to ask his questions too. So, Carlota, please go ahead. Carlota, you're on mute. Carlota, we can't hear you. Carlota, we can't hear you. you your microphone is muted. <laughs> okay. Now we can. No. Uh, maybe maybe you should take out the. You should stop sharing, Gustavo. Mm, good. That way we see everybody. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Doing your whole life experience plus any an incredible analysis. I think that it should be a course in Spruv. I mean. It's really, you've said things there that I am sure Spru is not teaching because it looks like it's all coming from experience. It's from working in the field. And much of technology policy theory is, I don't know, maybe from another time, but I think there is a lot of what you said that should now be incorporated. So your book, I'm going to recommend that Spruce somehow makes a course out of it because that makes an enormous difference 
if you really know. And I recognize many of the things you say because I was, of course, myself a, a technology policy person in the Venezuelan government. So I know what it was like and I have been working also. I worked as consultant for quite a while. So I know that there are many things in what you said that are very new to me, but I know where they come from. They come from the field. So I have four questions very quickly. Number one, your wife wanted to go back to some decent climate. How did you manage to move from, from here to Uruguay, from Uruguay to uh, Washington, from Washington to Uruguay to Peru and all that? Do you have a family? How do you do? Because when we think of people going to work for international organizations, they have families and there are all sorts of complications. So a very straightforward answer about whether you think that families where the wife and the husband both work and do, can they have a, a, an incredibly varied uh, uh, sort of life history, work history as you have? Or do you think that it's, I don't know, maybe your wife or your children or you don't have children, I don't know, but it looks like you're jumping all over the place for a long time and it must have been difficult. So I don't know if I should do one question after the other or all four questions in one go. What do you think, Melina? Go, if you, if you can reply shortly, which is something I can never do, uh, I think it's better if I do one, one you answer, the other you answer and so okay. on. Well, I mean, it, this is it's, it's a great question that requires a very long answer. I mean, it's not easy when you have a family and when you have two kids, like in my case. Uh, I think that uh, and some, some degree of compromise has, has to be achieved. In my case, it was not easy, this, this compromise, because my wife, uh, she's, uh, she's a pathologist. So she's a full trained pathologist. I mean, that she studied 10 years to be a pathologist, but you need to know that the validation of the medical uh, in degrees every country. countries Ooh. is completely different. So uh, at the beginning it was very difficult, uh, but somehow she managed to, I mean, go to academia and do some research. Uh, and be, when we spent some time, for example, when we spent five years in, in DC, uh, she worked at the National Institute of Health. So she, she managed to, to, I mean, she never practiced medicine. Uh, and, Mm. Again, that is, is be clear like that. <laughs> However, she managed to uh, accommodate to the situation in each one of the different uh, countries. Uh, and for the kids, uh, the solution for them, I think, is easier because uh, it's critical if you manage to enroll them in some sort of international school. Because one of the problems when you move from south to north is that the academic calendar is different. So if the, country, if the kids move from a, a public school from the south to a public school from the north and the other way around, uh, they are going to miss six months uh, in each move. So they can miss a year in each move uh, to, to mm -hmm. consider that you move from the, go to one direction and the other way. Uh, but to have international schools and normally these organizations like the IDRC or the, the IDB, they cover uh, partially cover the fees of these uh, international schools, but then, then you, I mean, you, they don't lose too much when they move from one to another. There is a, another dimension of the moving for them, which is the emotional dimension, but they need to change from uh, friends. friends and so on. But this is uh, getting less important over time because kids are becoming digital kids. No? So mm -hmm. uh, they play independently from, from, from where they, they are, they play with the friends from different countries uh, through internet. So this is something that mm -hmm. somehow they control, but it's difficult. There is a whole dimension for the kids that they call the third culture kids, which are the kids that are not from nowhere. If you ask to, I mean, and you, if you ask my children, if someone asks my children, where are you from? They don't know how, how what to answer. <laughs> they, 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 they were born. 
they see to me, I mean, they, they, they said, Doug, how should we answer, how should I answer this question? So it's difficult. It's difficult, but I mean, it's a compromise that you need to agree mm -hmm. to achieve in some way. Yeah, we're, we're encouraging people not to just go into academia, which is uh, comfortable, but that's, that's one of the problems if you go into international things. Yeah. Okay, my other question is whether this analysis that you have presented is yours from the book with your colleagues or if it's the IDB. I mean, uh, do they apply? I mean, is this a recognized set of understandings that the IDB applies or are you recognizing it from your experience and the IDB doesn't pay attention to you? No, no, Sorry. I think it's a, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a process of, I would say, it's an evolutionary process. I mean, we started uh, doing research on these topics um, at the bank when I arrived in 2009. And the book was published in 2014. So we had some time uh, with a group of researchers from the research department of the bank, in particular, Eduardo Fernandez Arias and Ernesto Stein, uh, to, to go through these different issues. Um, and I think that the book is a good compilation of what we have learned. Of course, the presentation and also the the chapters on entrepreneurship, innovation, innovative entrepreneurship, and uh, innovation of the book have some particular considerations that mainly are not completely covered in this presentation uh, that are, are my personal addition to this. But in general, I think that the book was the flagship book of the bank in 2014. It's the institutional book. So that means that most of the things that are in this presentation are also now included in bank policies, for example. You do, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's changing the bureaucracy, in particular the multilateral bureaucracy is not something that happens yeah, because... from one day to another. Uh, it's something that takes years, but if you persist uh, and you do good quality research, my experience has been that it's possible to do uh, these changes. Not all the changes, but sometimes the most important ones are, uh, I would say, internalized. I'm thinking that maybe I should give other people a chance and keep my other two questions for later so that I don't sort of... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you. <laughs> By the way, um, guys, Arto has put the link to the, the chat if you want to click on it and download it. Please go ahead. Uh, we have now a question from, from Benjamin, uh, who's a former master's student at SPRU. He's now doing the PhD. Benjamin, would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question quickly? Okay, thank you, Melina. Well, Gustavo, thanks very much for the presentation. It was super exciting to hear you. And much of the example of public, public coordination that you were saying, uh, at least for me, that I work for the public sector in Argentina, it was like, oh, yes. If we haven't worked before in the public sector, this is something that we don't learn in academia or at university, by, but by learning, by doing, no? Uh, so well, I, I just uh, want to ask quickly my question about uh, what you mentioned about the different approaches in the STI policies in Latin America. The first one, which is the linear model approach. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, at least in my experience working in Argentina, it seems to be the case that due to the, to, to the institutional framework and the academia or the research institutions there, it's still very much driven by public investment in R&D rather than uh, having a private investment in R&D as in the OECD countries, for example. And I think that's the case in, in, in other countries in, in, in Latin America as well. Even though there were like uh, attempts from a recent uh, policies approach to do a more systematic approach of, of, of STI policies. So what is your opinion about this like uh, bias towards the first linear model approach in SDI policies in Latin America, even in recent years? Well, uh, my question, my, my answer is, is you are right. I mean, there is a disconnection in Latin America and not only in Latin America, uh, a disconnection between the, the rhetoric of the theory of the policy, I mean, we do, do, do download policy documents. Everyone talk about innovation systems, 
uh, supply policies, demand policies, and so on. And then there is a gap between that and the way how policies are implemented. And the way how policies are implemented, I think, are still strongly biased towards the lineal model. Uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, we are in an institutional framework at the moment in Latin America, institutional uh, context, that is the accumulation of different paradigms that were put in place before. Uh, and, and in the area of implementation, still the dominant approach, uh, in my opinion, uh, how the policies are implementing is, uh, is with the focus on supply push science, for example, is still based on, on the lineal approach. It's changing. And I think one of the reasons this is changing is because um, I would say generational uh, change. I mean, you have a new wave of policy makers arriving to, to the region, uh, mainly uh, coming from SPRU and other organizations that are gradually taking the control of the policies and are putting in place new, new instruments or approaches without disactivate, disactivating the previous ones. So this is a problem still, mm -hmm. uh, but we have this gap. Uh, however, this is also a gap in Sweden, for example. I remember attending to a, a, a presentation by Professor uh, uh, Charles Edquist. Uh, he came to the bank about uh, a year ago and he mentioned that was a problem in Sweden. So when he said that that was a problem in Sweden, I said, okay, well, uh, and that's the reason why in Sweden, they, they have the science and technology, science and technology, an innovation council, but they realized that that council was completely under uh, the influence of the linear model and it was impossible to include in the policy, the innovation side and general. So they, they created a new council, an innovation council, which is different from the science and technology council focused only on innovation. So these type of things are, are, are typical Latin America, but not only typical Latin America. Great, thank you very much, Gustavo. Uh, next in line, we have Federico. Federico was on like watching the YouTube live stream, but he is now with us in the session. Federico, it's okay if you ask in Spanish or if you prefer, I can read that, that your question for you. Um, hi, no, I, I can, I can, hello everyone. No, oh. I can just phrase it in, in English. It was a, a question about, um, more about research and science policy and not just innovation policy, because the bank, at least in Argentina, uh, is funding the, like, a lot of basic research. And my, my question was about um, which is the vision or the main frameworks, ideas you have at the bank about uh, basic or fundamental research. Well, oof, this is, is going to take a... Uh, long to answer, but to be very briefly, uh, every year, each division of the bank, no, every year, sorry, every five years, each division of the bank has to publish an updated version of the, what we call it, sectoral framework. The sectoral framework is the reflection of what happened on the field during the previous five years and how we're going to move forward for the next five years in terms of the type of project that we'd like to uh, push in each one of the countries. Uh, so this document is going to be ready for the science and technology innovation area, but it's going to be ready uh, in a couple of months. So and this document is going to have a much more detailed uh, analysis on uh, how to move forward in the area of science uh, and research policy. However, one, one of the things that I think are important to, to, to push uh, forward is uh, some critical elements, like for example, the promotion of open science, uh, the promotion of interdisciplinary research, uh, and the promotion of interinstitutional research. And finally, the promotion of mission-oriented research. So these are the four things that are going to be uh, critical elements of the new uh, sectoral framework in the area of research that we're going to be pushing forward in the different countries. That's very interesting. Glad to hear that, Gustavo. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now we have Rafael. Rafael, would you like to 
say who you are and ask your question. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for for your presentation. It's it's very interesting to see how the experience in the field has led you to this conclusions about what we should do and how we should design our institution, institutional frameworks. Uh, I do have two, two questions, if, if possible. The, the first one is on your idea of implementing policies as a way to get to know the problems in a certain sector. Um, and in that sense, is there a way to differentiate between like what are the actual problems in a, in a sector versus what might be problems in the policy design? I'm thinking, for example, let's say that um, uh, a sector in particular has a problem and you your first conclusion is well maybe they need more financing and you start financing lines but they are so complex that no one uses them so is that a problem in the sector are you learning about the sector really or is there more a problem of policy design and how can you kind of in terms of procedures can, how can you differentiate and evaluate them uh, separately my second question is uh, what are your thoughts on the, um, how can we generate institutional capabilities in the current Latin American, um, American context of unrest and distrust in institutions? Uh, basically, if there are no robust democratic mechanisms in our countries, how can we generate credibility for institutions and with that generate capabilities? I'd like to know your thoughts on, on that. Thank you. Well, uh, okay, these are two very important questions. I think that the, regarding the first question uh, uh, about the, the differentiation between the real problems that the sector face versus the problems with the policy design, I think that uh, in this uh, uh, experience of the uh, sector executive boards, uh, this are, uh, has been a very rich experience in terms of identifying both. I mean, both things show up in the discussion. Uh, sometimes uh, is related to a particular problem that the sector face. For example, uh, talking about Peru, uh, Peru cannot export shrimps to China because the national uh, aquaculture uh, office doesn't have the labs that China requires to do the quality control. Okay, that, that is, a, is, a, is, a, is a particular problem and it's solved with a new institution which is now have been put in place. But sometimes you have problems with policy design that are very clear. I mean, for example, uh, we launched in Peru a, a policy instrument uh, for, you know, for open innovation. So the idea was to use the capabilities of large companies that in Peru are mostly focused on natural resource-based industries as a platform to develop a high and more sophisticated suppliers to these particular industries. Uh, and then we have a lot of applicants from the agro experts, mm -hmm. which is good. I mean, you know, Peru is the first world product uh, uh, exporter of uh, blueberries, for example or uh, avocados. And we had a lot of big companies willing to do research with small companies from Peru and research centers in genetics of uh, blueberries and avocado. But we didn't have any um, from the mining sector, which is quite weird because we have big companies here in the mining sector. And one of the reasons when we gather with them and we talk in this board, why is that you are not using the program and it was not that they didn't know, they know, they knew about it, they wanted to use the product, but it was a requirement that by, the Chile, by the Peruvian government that in order to receive public funding from the government to a big multi, multinational company to do the research, they needed to create a separate bank account. Mm -hmm. And creating a separate bank account for the, they had to get a permission from the headquarters of the BHP, which is in Melbourne, for example, that was impossible to do. So it was just a problem. It was a completely procedural problem. It's a, it was a procedure, and that was uh, an, uh, identified during the board during the board meeting. So mm -hmm. I think it's important that uh, this type of public, 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 private interactions are very important for two, for the two things: to identify the problem, but also to identify 
in many cases that a, what you think was a good policy, the small letter of the policy make that the policy was not the right policy for that particular sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing, institutional capabilities and uh, in countries of Latin America, well, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's, government continuity is a problem. Uh, and changes, think normally change every five years in country like Peru, <laughs> much lower than that. Uh, so it's, it's difficult, uh, but I think this is the, a big role of multilateral organizations and not only banks, not only the IDB or the World Bank, but also institutions like, for example, the OECD, ECLAC, uh, these are organizations that are there. Uh, so, for example, in my case, um, since I arrived, in, I arrived in Peru in January 2019, uh, which is about two years and, and a half. Uh, in these two years and a half, I had about uh, four different ministers of production uh, and about seven different vice ministers of the industry. And so what I have is a, is a PPP presentation of what the government what we have been doing with the government and we are planning to do in the future with government. And this PPP presentation changed, have, I have one, one for each one of the different ministries that came to power in the last, uh, in the last uh, two years. So the role of multilateral organizations is somehow is to protect uh, government continuity, uh, to look for the long term, and also to facilitate in that process capabilities accumulation, because you can say to the government, the first uh, reaction of the ministry uh, when come to power is to say, look, I'm going to change the whole innovation program. And by changing, I mean, I'm going to replace the people. But then you can put forward and say, look, be careful ministry, don't change anyone from this program that is working well, unless you are completely sure about the person that you are going to put in place. Mm -hmm. And to be sure of that, if that program is under an IDB or World Bank financing program, you have to require a non-objection to the bank. And in my experience in Peru, it has been a long uh, number of cases, a several number of cases where I have rejected non-objections to replace people. So these are mechanisms you can use to guarantee that in the context of volatility and changes, you at least can guarantee that some core of capabilities remain in place and can move from uh, one administration to the other administration. Thank you. Gustavo, now we have a question from Jorge. Jorge, would you like to quickly introduce yourself and ask your question? Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Jorge, I'm a research fellow at SPRU. I'm from Colombia. Um, I'm nice to meet some of you. And also Gustavo, nice talk, really, really interesting. Um, and my question is, it's a kind of follow-up from um, the ones that, that they've been asked in this session. And it's about, um, so in the face of the pandemic um, and in the aftermath of the pandemic, to what extent the SDI policies that are set out in Latin America need to be challenged and um, reoriented? Um, and do we need, do, do, do we have the right rhetoric to, to face this crisis? But do well, uh, well, well, I mean, we don't have neither the good rhetoric, neither the good capabilities <laughs> to face a crisis like this. Uh, however, we need to be clear that the crisis is also an opportunity to uh, put science and technology innovation right to the core of innovation policies in the future. Uh, there are some things that the pandemic is generating in the region and also at the world level, but in the particular region, in the region, the pandemic is generating, for example, um, I would say digitization, fast, massive digitization, E-commerce in Lima increased 400% in one year. This is something that it was in 
I mean, impossible to, 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 to predict before. Uh, you have sectors that are uh, losing, clearly losing in the pandemic, like the tourism sector, like the commerce sector, but there are also sectors that are booming, like the one related to health, for, ex for example, no? and, and also the one related with the information technologies. Uh, so there is a huge space there to do policies to reinvent sectors and move resources from those sectors that are going down to those sectors that are basically booming. And also there is a massive space for, uh, for rethink innovation, in particular science policy, because what we have realized from the pandemics is that the solution of the pandemic, that the pandemic is a scientific problem. And the solution of the pandemic will be a scientific policy. Uh, and so we need to rethink about how science policies are implemented uh, in the region. And this idea of promoting uh, more mission-oriented science, more open science, more interdisciplinary science, and more uh, interinstitutional science uh, comes from what we have, we have learned from the pandemic. Countries are not ready to face the, the next pandemic. But this pandemic is an opportunity to create capacities to be better prepared for the next pandemic. And this requires a lot of investments in, for example, biological sciences, but also in uh, uh, social sciences, humanities, uh, infrastructure, technological labs, uh, and, and uh, regulatory process for the new uh, pharmaceutical products and so on. There are a lot of things that need to be done uh, to be ready, not for this one, but for the next pandemic. And the funny thing is that we had those kind of policies in the 80s and then we stretched them yeah. out, right? Yeah. Uh, hopefully, not all the countries do it, did the scratching, the scratching uh, uh, in, with the same degree of intensity. Yeah. So there are some countries where some capabilities uh, uh, remain in place. Uh, and, and, and I think that, uh, for example, we, we have been doing in collaboration with uh, many of you, I think, should know her, is Annabel Marin. She, she's uh, also a former graduate from SPRU. Now she's working for the IB, IBS. She's back in Sussex, but working for the IBS. We did a research comparing the response of the biotechnology sector uh, to the pandemic, comparing uh, different countries of Latin America, then we, we realized that there are three models, not one model. The Argentinian model that well, the response was uh, not optimal, but it was not that bad. And that the result of accumulation, a lot of accumulation of capabilities in pharmaceutical into from the past. Then you had the Brazilian model, which is a model of technology transfer. Uh, and diffusion from public research organizations that are very strong in the case of Brazil, like Pio Cruz and Bucantan. And then you have uh, uh, the Colombia <laughs> uh, and, and, and so on. I mean, there are different and so on. I mean, there are different, uh, different uh, variations in according how the countries approach to the pandemic. Thank you, Gustavo. And Carlota, back to you. I'm back. <laughs> well, much of what I wanted to ask has been somehow in, in, in the questions and answers before. <clears throat> so I want to combine. Uh, you said, you talked about two things. One about capture, where you mentioned the science, uh, you know, the scientific group as capturing. I have always felt that. And I have always wondered if the Swedish solution of separating so that the money that goes to science and education, which is also the Israeli solution, the money, science and education and the money for technology and innovation goes separately, uh, together with the idea that you also had about the, about the quality of government and how important it is for capabilities in government in order to succeed. So taking those things two together, I was just wondering whether you had as IDB uh, the capacity to serve as the pollinator, 
you know, take the example from one country and bring it to another country, give, you know, move people so that they see how it's done over there, so that somehow the best solutions, considering we're very similar as a continent, we, we always apply similar policies. Are you capable? Do you have among your rights to do? I don't know, because you know, international organizations have to be super careful not to intervene and all that. Can you actually promote uh, the use of the best, best practice across the continent or are you too hands tight to do that? No, uh, we actually, we do that. Uh, and we do that we quite do a it. lot. Yes, it's, uh, I mean, one of the mandate of the bank is the promotion of uh, this type of, uh, what we call it regional public goods. Um, and, mo uh, and many times these public goods I think that uh, a country has managed to solve that can be transferred to uh, other countries. And we have several instruments for that. Um, for me, the most important one is the, what we call it the reg regional policy dialogue. We have country level policy dialogues, but we also have uh, twice per year, uh, regional uh, policy dialogues where we are gathered with uh, within two or three days with the main authorities of all the countries to discuss some particular issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do quite a lot of collaboration. So uh, we have pr practical uh, example for these collaborations. For example, in terms of uh, innovation policy, uh, we have the regional network of Latin American um, innovation agencies, RELAI, that is funded by the bank uh, with completely non-reimbursable funding. So it's not lending, it's basically money for free. And with the idea of having these uh, agencies working together, for example, on, and now they are doing a project with Nesta to carry out a, a, what we call it a benchmark study of uh, the different agencies of the region, trying to identify which is the, are the, the gaps in the different capabilities that they need to, for example, promote. Uh, another example of that is uh, Argentina. In Argentina, we have been very involved in promoting the National Space Program, uh, mm -hmm. which is a satellite program that uh, have uh, launched different satellites for meteorological and also agricultural information over the last, uh, let's say, 10 or more years, about 15 years. So we have created another network. It's a network of regional network of space agencies, in Latin America, where the information that's being captured by the Argentinian satellites, because the satellites are not over to Argentina, they go around the earth. <laughs> so they collect information for all the countries. So the information for the other countries is put, uh, uh, is made available to all the uh, space agencies of the, the region to, to use for policy advice, to use for agricultural policy, uh, 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 weather policy, et cetera. So these are examples of things that we do uh, quite a lot uh, in we permanently do that. And the other thing that uh, is important for this cross polarization is that we, the, the, the personnel of the bank, the staff, uh, we move from different countries. So when we move from one country to another, we take all the background. Uh, and the bank, when, when they move you, they try to uh, interact the moving between a country with capabilities to a country with low capabilities. So I was in Peru, it was, I was in Uruguay, Uruguay before, where capabilities are somehow quite strong. So the, 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 the bank didn't want to move me to Chile, for example, to Brazil. They moved me to Peru, which is a country with lower capabilities with the idea that you can bring your knowledge, and you can bring your experience, your learning from the country of high capability to a country of low capability and the other way around. So this is another, these are different strategies that the bank follow to promote this cross fertilization between countries. One, I think probably there's only time for one last question. I don't know, I, I think probably four minutes. Uh, Green, what's yes. happening? Are, are you doing anything about, I mean, can you also give direction like the green direction? Are you doing anything about it and how yeah, do no. you do it? I mean, uh, the bank has the mandate, uh, and this is the, it's a very it's a very strict mandate because it's something that was uh, put on the table by the non-borrowing members of the bank, in particular the European banks. As a, the bank has uh, more than fifty-five members, 
Uh, 27 are countries that can receive funding, some of the borrowing countries, Latin America and Caribbean, and seven Caribbean countries. The rest are uh, donor donors. Mm -hmm. And the donors have put uh, in the agenda that by 2025, 30% of the bank financing overall has to be green. So in the, in the area of science and technology innovation, uh, this uh, is translated under the concept of promoting green innovation. Uh, um, we have just approved a new program for Peru uh, that was developed in very close collaboration with Pavel here, and also with a strong support by our common friend, Francisco Sagasti, uh, that 30% uh, of all the financing for uh, research and innovation consortium, for example, for uh, including uh, the adoption of technology for SMEs, uh, uh, have to be in technologies that are uh, aligned with climate change adaptation and mitigation. Good. So that is, that is going to be a big thing. And we are going to be asking for people for our different divisions and for my own divisions with a strong background in green innovation, that's for sure. Mm. Wonderful, thank you very much.